2018. We have two dead bodies that are dropped off at Memorial Miramar, Christopher Thomas and Anthony Williams. You have Cortland Henry, who's lying about anything and everything. He's lying about the location of where it happened. He's lying about when it happened. He's lying about the Mr. Demons, the defendant, being in the car at any point that evening. Totally omits that. We then have the cover-up that begins. So the question is why? Why does there need to be cover-up? Because there was a murder that was committed, ladies and gentlemen, that's why. There were two murders that were committed. And so from here, we're going to talk about and explain what, what we have, right? So Detective Moretti and the Miramar Police Department have to answer four questions. Who, what, when, and where? And so for the where, I want to start with where did the lethal shots come from? And let's start and focus on that part of the investigation. So the where, we look to Chris Williams. If you remember, Sergeant Williams came in and testified and showed you how Blue Star works, showed you how shooting reconstructions are done with the trajectory rods. This explained how Miramar had made a good attempt, but they lacked training. So he came in and went through and is able to explain, as an expert in shooting reconstruction, what happened in this car. So we're going to start on the trajectory rods. If you recall, on the outside, the most important aspect of the ones on the outside of the car is they show that this was not a drive-by. That they're coming in at 90 <coughs> degrees, that there's no keyholing. If you remember, you learned about keyholing. That would be an angle of entry on that. So he then showed you the blue star. And if you recall, ladies and gentlemen, this chemical reacts no matter how many years later, no matter what attempt at cleanup is done, the chemical is still going to react to the presence of the blood. So then you have that reaction. And that reaction, ladies and gentlemen, tells you that someone is sitting in the seat. Because, as Detective Williams illustrated, it's where the blue star isn't. So <laughs> there is no blood. There's no blood where someone would have been sitting. There's no blood where their legs would have been, and you can see on the V that's indicated on that. And there's no blood on the back of the seat. So ladies and gentlemen, what does that tell you? The killer was sitting there. And there's no blood because something was blocking it from getting onto that area of the car. So what do we know as well from this car? We know that there was also that this door was closed. How can that be said? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the blue star here shows that this door was shut because there was blood on this door handle. You have from this, as well, the headliner. So the headliner shows directionality. The headliner shows the way Anthony Williams' head was positioned when he was shot. That's one aspect of it. That DNA that was tested is all Anthony Williams, but we'll get to that. So, the, the DNA, very strong support. 51.2 septillion times more likely to be that of Anthony Williams than any unrelated individual in the world. That was from Kurt Rhodes. If you recall, he was the expert on DNA. He told you and taught you how DNA is done, how everything works. So now, putting those two things together, you can say, and the evidence shows, 
Anthony Williams, the way his head was in that Jeep, is that he is sitting in this front passenger seat, and as you can see, all the blood is dripping down the back of the seat. That tells you, ladies and gentlemen, and from the angle of entry when we get to the medical examiner's information, that his head was right here. So then we have one of the things that Detective Williams relied upon was the shirt of Cortland Henry. If you recall, there is a spot of blood on the front of the shirt. That blood, as Kurt Rhodes then told you, belongs to Anthony Williams. What does that tell you, ladies and gentlemen? That during the course of this shooting, Cortland Henry has his back against the driver's seat and is driving wearing this shirt when the shooting occurs. You know from that that he is not the shooter. Why? Because if he was the shooter, the angle to get that wouldn't have the blood on the front of the shirt. It would have it coming across the driver's side and towards the side of the shirt, not the front. So on here you have the blowback coming there, and that's, again, 32.2 septillion times more likely to be the DNA of Anthony Williams. So then we have the back of the shirt. And so if you recall, the blood on the back of the shirt is right here. And that blood, Christopher Thomas, a single source profile. So what does that tell you, ladies and gentlemen? That tells you that Portland Henry didn't fire the fatal shot for Christopher Thomas. Here's why. That blood is coming from Mr. Thomas when he is shot. The blood's only moving like that, as you heard from Sergeant Williams, when there is a pulse, when there is pressure. Remember the garden hose analogy that he used and talked about? That's when you're getting the blood that's going to be coming out of the body. And on that, so from there, you know, Portland Henry is ducked over and flinching away from Christopher Thomas. So he cannot get that shot on Christopher Thomas from where he is sitting in the driver's seat. Even if he was in the back seat, let's argue that for a second. To get the blood there, he would have to have been completely turned facing backwards to Mr. Thomas and then turned and shot over his shoulder to get blood on the back of the shirt. That's not reasonable inside of a car. What is reasonable is that he's driving, the shot happens to Anthony Williams in the back of the head, blood gets on the front of the shirt. He flinches, comes down, shot happens to Christopher Thomas, blood gets on the back of the shirt. So that was the other aspect that we learned from Anthony Williams because there was the entrance and the exit wound. So from there, ladies and gentlemen, you can tell, again, the side-to-side orientation of the head because that front passenger window is blown out. That tells you that his head was not upright, but it was leaning over to the side because if you recall, the entrance on Mr. Williams is back behind his left ear and the exit is up here in his hairline. If he was sitting up and awake and knew what was going on, you would expect to find a projectile in the headliner and the roof of that Jeep, but you don't. Instead, you know, based on his head angle, that it goes out the window, blows out the glass. For Christopher Thomas, he is in the rear. So what do you know about Christopher Thomas's wound? that it's coming in at almost 90 degrees on the left side of his face, and that there is stippling. You learned about stippling. The imprint of unburnt gunpowder into the skin of a living human being. Powder tattooing, it's also called. So on Christopher Thomas, you learned from Sergeant Williams, as well as from the medical examiners, that the firearm that inflicted that wound was approximately three inches to no more than three feet. Sergeant Williams said 
his estimation is no more than 12 inches away. And so why is that important? Let's go back and argue the Cortland Henry. If Cortland Henry was making these shots from the driver's seat, you would expect Anthony Williams to be covered in stipple because they're that much closer and nothing would be blocking or impeding that shot. But if the shot is instead coming from the rear passenger side, you're not going to have that same stippling on Anthony Williams because the seat's in the way. Cortland Henry, there is nothing blocking it, so you have the stippling. So ladies and gentlemen, that's one of the things that you would notice and the differences that show that why it could not have been Cortland Henry in the driver's seat with this weapon. We know it can the back seat passenger, it could have been, because there is stippling. If it was the back seat passenger was shot by the driver, you wouldn't see that pattern of stippling because they couldn't get close enough to make that pattern in that imprint. So then we have all the drive by on the trajectory rods that we talked about briefly. But this one is important because this is talking about strike K. So why is strike K important, right? Strike K comes in and hits the front of the rear door. That tells you that that door was open when that drive by was staged. Because as you heard from Sergeant Williams, if this was actually a drive-by, this is what you would have seen. Strikes coming in at different angles, at obtuse angles, there would be angles of entry that would show either a pattern of speeding up or slowing down. But instead, you have them coming in at 90 degrees. And that goes for the front, on the driver's side door, the rear driver's side door, and then you have strike K going across. And remember, this is Chris Carter took this picture that shows you where strike K impacted this door. If this door had been closed, you would expect it to be going into the speaker. That's where you would expect it if it had been a closed door. That's not what happened. Also, if that had happened during a drive-by, whoever was sitting in that rear driver's side passenger seat would have had a projectile right through their knees. That was the path of that bullet. Talking about as well on the driver. If you recall, ladies and gentlemen, projectiles are found underneath the brake pedal. You don't see any injuries on Mr. Henry. He got out of that car too. So the shots from the back of the car same angle of entry. They're not coming from the side. They're not coming in like there's any difference. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I have to talk about the medical examiner's information. I know it's difficult. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a picture up briefly, then I'm going to move to a blank slide to talk about it. So everyone, i do not trying to traumatize anyone. Is part of the case and it's evident, so I'm, I apologize. So as you've learned, Anthony Williams' autopsy was conducted by Dr. McDougall. Dr. McDougall, if you remember, had COVID. She came in and testified. So again, we have Anthony Williams. What did you learn during the course of <coughs> Anthony Williams' autopsy? You learned that this is one of three times that Dr. McDougall could ever testify what was the fatal shot, and which shots were post-mortem. And so I'm gonna move on, and the next picture is going to show the fatal shot. Again, A is the entry wound, and E is the exit wound. And again, that shows the angle in which his head was positioned. And also, it shows the lack of stippling, showing that that firearm was further away than that of Chris from the wound that was inflicted on Christopher Thomas. So then I'm going to show you for comparison the difference with the post-mortem, where it's white, there's no hemorrhaging, there's no signs of life, <coughs> body bleeding, 
on these wounds. And these are the ones, if you recall, to his shoulder and to his torso. And so the one from his torso, which is B, came in through the side of the car and was into his body. And if you recall, the one that's site C came from one of the shots through the back of the car and into his shoulder. Moving on to Dr. Sauters with Christopher Thomas. As to Christopher Thomas, you learned about the stippling and the pattern that's on them. You learned the distance determination and you learned that the wound through his head was the one that caused his death. And that was the one for which he was alive. You learned that when you're stippling, those are those tiny black implanted bits of gunpowder. So if you recall from George Bellow, he drew the cone. You have a firearm, and as the parts from the firearm that are expelled, you have the projectile that goes forward, and then you have the cloud that gets increasingly bigger as it travels away from the muzzle of the gun. The example, if you take a handful of dust, sand, and a golf ball. You learn the golf ball is going to go the farthest because it has the most mass. It has the most weight to it. So the most energy can be transported to it. The golf ball is like your bullet. The sand <coughs> is your unburnt powders of gunpowder. It's going to travel, not as far, but it has more mass, so more energy can be transferred to it than that of the dust. The dust falls out quickly. That's why we can say it's not three inches, but that's why they can say it's less than three feet from the medical examiner's perspective. So going to the wounds on his back. Again, no signs whatsoever of any blood hemorrhaging in any of those wounds. There are projectiles that intersect his lungs you heard Dr. Sauter testify that the lungs bleed profusely if a person is alive. So ladies and gentlemen, from all of this, at this point, the state has established that there was someone in that rear seat. The someone who is in that rear seat is the person who committed this murder. And so now the question is who? So I'm going to show you now why the state has proven who was Jamel Dennis. So we have the studio video. This is going to go through and you can track the defendant wearing that lyrical lemonade sweater all the way out to the Jeep where he gets in the spot the murderer sat in. It's important to notice, ladies and gentlemen, that phone, always, always, always in his hand. He doesn't let go of it, still in his right hand as he's going to go get in that rear driver's side seat. Same with that satchel. And recall, ladies and gentlemen, that satchel and the one that you see Christopher Thomas wearing are never recovered. So they were taken out of the car by the defendant. So let's talk about <coughs> the mobile records and the phones and why this is important. Okay. So the question is, are the phones themselves, do they know where they are? And then does the network know where the phone is? So this, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the exhibits that was put in. And this is the phone of Mr. Dennis at 3.18 a.m. If you will notice that there is right here a camera icon and that is located at 8.05 Northeast 4th Avenue because that's the camera from the studio that you just watched. And the blue pin is where the network thinks the phone is. Is it perfectly precise? No. But is it accurate? Yes, within a football field, right? We learned that less than 78 meters is the range on those bands for the timing advance. 
But this isn't the time in advance. This is where the network thinks the phone is. Ladies and gentlemen, the phones work. You know the phones work because in your daily life, when you need to go anywhere, you go into a mapping app and you put an address in. You don't have to know where you are to get somewhere because the phone knows where you are. These are things that you use on a daily basis. It's common sense. The phones work because you've used them. We've relied on them for years to show exactly where, how to get someplace. Look, in a populated area like this where there's multi-story buildings, okay, maybe it's a little bit more difficult to say precisely where a phone is. You can order a pizza by sending a drop in. The phones work, ladies and gentlemen. We rely on them in our everyday life. So let's go and talk about the T-Mobile and the Sprint records. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm putting up here is what I believe the evidence reflects. This doesn't go back with you. You don't get to take a copy of this into the back, but this is all things that are in evidence. This is a summary of them. So these are all the phone numbers that were in use in October of 2018. I am not suggesting they are still being used by these individuals. So at this point, the state has established, based on the business records from Sprint, Christopher Thomas, 772-713-2341. Anthony Williams, 954-248-9081. Mr. Demons, 772-713-9807. Cortland Henry, 561-720-3210. Jamie King, the mother of Mr. Demons, 772-501-6942. Jameson Francois, track, the manager, 954-376-9158. Frederick Gibbons, the Louisiana-based rapper who lived in the next community over. 225-529-5054. And then Dontavius Withers, one of the other individuals in the Red Mitsubishi. 954-371-7895. So from these phone numbers and those records are where we're getting the information as to where the people work. And ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to go through and look at those records. Look at who the subscriber is. Jamie King was paying for the phone of Anthony Williams and Jamel Demons. <coughs> Doesn't mean she was using it. In fact, she's listed under the billing industry, <coughs> and that's her number. So you have that, and that's the 772-713-9807. And you can tell the date the service began, November 30th, 2017. <coughs> and ladies and gentlemen, it's important to look at these things and things that start before the murder. Because when people are creating email accounts, when they're setting up social media, when they're buying phones years before, they're not trying to hide anything at that point. So I submit to you that those are things that are reliable because there's no motive at that point to lie. So we have again, like I said, she's under the billing for Miss King. So we have Portland Henry. And so if you recall, Detective Moretti talked to you about Portland Henry because it was a question of, it's so weird he doesn't have a phone. Well, you learned that the phone that he had was a pay-as-you-go phone. So it was a minute phone. And you also learned that every single phone call that came into that phone on October 26th of 2018 went straight to voicemail. What's a reasonable inference, ladies and gentlemen? The phone wasn't on. He didn't have minutes or it was broken. 
That's what those records show. They don't show Mr. Henry making a ton of phone calls and passing the phone off to someone else. No, they show a phone that was not operating. So looking at the CDRs, so this is from Mr. Demons, the 9807 phone number. What I've done, 840-34 at the top, that's going to be the time that reflects on the records as you can look at them. <coughs> that's the UTC. So as you've learned, that the difference between UTC, or Greenwich Mean Time, in Florida, in, on October 26th of 2018, is four hours. So that is four hours ahead. So to get from UTC time to Florida, you subtract four. Until November 4th of 2018, daylight savings time, right? Fall back. Then you subtract five hours. But for the time in question, October 26th, 2018, you subtract four. That's the same whether you're looking at the CDRs, whether you're looking at the Facebook or Instagram records. So that way you can help and cross-reference to see what's going on with an individual phone and where that phone is when these messages are being sent and when the social media is being accessed. So if you recall, ladies and gentlemen, we learned that the 805-637-7249, if you see an incoming phone call, and then that immediately outgoing to that number says it goes to voicemail. So right there, you have at 5.03 a.m., Jamie King calling the phone of Jamel Demons, her son, and being sent straight to voicemail. Then you have an incoming phone call from Frederick Gibbons, Frito Bang, that lasts 491 seconds. You then have another <clears throat> incoming call, only 11 seconds, and then Jamie King again sent to voicemail. So let's talk about the surveillance footage. And I know, I warned you ahead of time, there are some parts of this that are incredibly boring, utterly tedious, but they're important. And sometimes it's the smallest details that show that Look, this is what it says it is. So you have here 3.35 a.m., 36 seconds. And as you recall, <coughs> this is the camera that sits on 595 on the entrance and exit to the express lanes. You learn from Detective Moretti that the express lanes toll camera all the way out past 136th Street. So ladies and gentlemen, from here, you know from the studio at 3.19 a.m., we're now 3.35, 16 minutes later. We have two cars, and you can go and pull this up, and if you need any assistance with doing that, we'll be happy to bring it back up in court and show it to you. You have two cars, and you can watch so the top lanes are looking east towards Fort Lauderdale. So when you watch these videos, you'll see two cars that come here on the eastbound, and then they're gonna pop up down here on the westbound camera, and they're heading west. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, that if you watch these two cars, one red and one gray, <coughs> you will see them come up here and go to the left to get onto the ramp over to I-75 South. You can see here the lights going to the Sawgrass Expressway up to the Panther Arena. But if you watch those two cars at 335, that's what you will see. They go over to the left, head south towards Miramar Parkway. And so what you've learned, again, we have the camera icon, and then we have where the phone suggests the network it says it is. Blue dot right there at the bottom. Again, meters, not miles. We then have McDonald's, 347.56 and 346.57. So one second apart on 
those two cameras. And there, remember, we saw the red car go first, then the gray Jeep on 595. You're looking here, red car, gray car. So, on surveillance footage. When a business, a private residence, puts up surveillance cameras, they're not there for the benefit of law enforcement. They're there for the benefit of that business. So they're not required to capture the street that goes by. They're not required by any law to maintain those videos for any longer than they feel is necessary. They're there to make sure that if someone's coming through and burglarizing their business, they capture that information. The fact that they also happen to catch the cars going by is dumb luck. But this is not just dumb luck, because this is one of the parts of the investigation that Detective Moretti talked to you about, that they went out and went to multiple businesses. And look, these aren't officers that have been there two weeks on the job. Detective Murray talked about, yeah, I've done tons of investigations at Walmart. I know their video retention policies. This is their jurisdiction that they are intimately familiar with as to where these cameras are and what they show. If you have a camera that's pointing in the completely wrong direction, you don't need to waste time to go in and look at something that's not going to show you anything. Or if you know the data retention period has already passed, because most are seven days or less, you don't need to go back and do that again. So if you look at, again, we have the McDonald's. This is where the network thinks the phone is at 347. Meters, not miles. But this is showing you that those records are accurate. They're not explicitly precise, but they are accurate. Going to 3.53 a.m., this is the Montessori Academy. So ladies and gentlemen, you can see there's the Montessori Academy, and there is traffic. There is a car that is consistent with that gray Jeep going by at 3.53, at 4.06, and again before 4.20. You can watch that and look at that. It's not like there's no cars, there's nothing out there. There is things that corroborate that cell phone evidence. We have Sunset Lakes. That shows, and again, 3.50 a.m. So ladies and gentlemen, you learned a lot about the geography of Miramar and Fort Lauderdale and the distances between them. <coughs> you learned from 8.05 northeast 4th Avenue in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to Sunset Lakes, the 40th Street Visitor's Entrance, you're looking at about 30, 31 miles. Detective Moretti talked to you about driving that route, and rather than spend 45 minutes doing that drive, he instead did the 16-minute version flying over to be able to show you all of these locations in a much quicker, expedient process. So you know that the red Mitsubishi goes 30 miles in 30 minutes. That's an average speed of 60 miles an hour. <coughs> and so you have in that the phone of Dontavious Withers. Mr. Withers has been identified as the person who was driving. And you have Travion Glass in that front passenger seat. Ladies and gentlemen, watch that video, please. You can see Mr. Glass moving his hands. You can see that he's awake at the time of this guard game. Watch it. If you need help again, we're happy to assist. So then we have 4.03 a.m. So at 4.03 a.m., ladies and gentlemen, we have a very specific location the network thinks the phone is. And this goes back to being in the big city, right? We're here in this courtroom. Right there we can see Third Avenue out the window. We can see the New River. 
Phone doesn't know if we're on the fourth floor, fifth floor, sixth floor. But we could be anywhere in this building, right? That's the beauty of Pembroke Road and US 27. Because what you've learned, ladies and gentlemen, is that on the west side of Highway US 27, there is a canal. You've learned that 208 Avenue is gated on the north and the south ends. That there is a Pembroke Pines fire training facility out there, so it's locked. You've learned that at the end of Pembroke Road, out here to the east on this map, there's another set of closed gates that prevents any further eastern traffic. You've learned that there's a waste management recycling facility out there. <coughs> Again, another gate, an area you can't get into easily. So because of that, that limits the places the phone can be. It's not in a helicopter, it's in a car. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. So let's talk about the timing advance. For Mr. Dennett's phone, I want to make sure it's clear when we're going through outdoor stationary I've highlighted in green. So from 319 outdoor stationary, mobile, 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 So 403, outdoor stationary, then mobile again, all the way until 440. Why is that important? Well, let's look at the pattern of travel. Let's look at what the phone is showing where it thinks it is. Ladies and gentlemen, just think about cellular telephones. Think about how they can tell you're mobile. Most human beings can't run 60 miles per hour on their feet. <coughs> So if you think about the speed at which a phone is traveling, that's going to tell the cell phone company whether it's mobile, <coughs> inside a building, or outside. If someone is outside, not moving, nothing's obstructing, there's no concrete, there's no rebar, there's no electrical wiring interfering with their phone getting a clear signal to a tower, to the satellite for GPS, that's going to tell them outdoor stationary. And ladies and gentlemen, this is common sense. These are things that you know on a daily basis that you have to deal with with your own cell phones. You go into a really tall building, <coughs> hard to get a signal. You have to go out to a window. And just because that is out there, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't mean that we're saying it's 100% accurate. We're saying that it is reliable on that. That it is also able to be corroborated by other evidence. What do I mean? 3.18 a.m., where it says the defendant is outdoor stationary, guess what the video at the studio shows? The defendant outside. When it says out here at 4.40 and 4.42, outdoor stationary. Guess what the other evidence shows? The defendant outside sending a drop pin to his buddy from that phone. So let's talk about the pawn slip. <coughs> Again, this goes to showing when you are not. I'm sorry. It's a good time to do it. I hope you're saying. Yes, sir. I'm told uh, someone needs to rush for break. We'll give a short recess. We cannot discuss the case this morning. Please call the case on the We'll discuss the case in present, certainly no research. Thank you. Just leave your notes on your chair. It's the jury for us.
Council, if you're ready to proceed with your closing event. So, continuing on on the pond slip. Why have a pond slip, right? Seems kind of silly. But again, it goes back to showing that you're not planning on the murder. Excuse me, Eric. Yes, sir. When you are not planning a murder, you use your real phone number. And this isn't, oh, this was where I could be reached. He was calling jewelry. You have this in evidence. And you've heard from Amber Allen, who testified that that is the defendant's thumbprint. You have his signature where he is stating that everything on that document, that the facts stated in it are true. There's a fact. His cell phone number is 772-713-9807. So I'm going to go to the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles records. You have his name, his driver's license number, his signature. The same driver's license number, signature, and name that you have on the consulate. Then you have the booking prints, where you heard from Deputy Maycock that yes, he took the prints of the defendant on February of 2019. And that is the same thumbprint that's on that booking print that's on that consulate. So let's talk a little bit about the cast analysis. That was the FBI Special Agent Brandon Collins. He looked at not just one phone, but compared and contrasted two phones in each of these particular analysis slides that he compiled. And those are in evidence, and you are, feel free to look at those and refer to those. So we have here between 3.20 a.m. and 3.57 a.m., 772-713-9807, Mr. Demon's phone, and the 9081, Mr. Williams' phone, are all tracking together. If you recall, when there are circles, Special Agent Collins is indicating they are using the same cell tower. He's not plotting in terms of the distance on those. That's all he's indicating with that. So this is showing the pattern of travel that at each of these points, they're using the same cell towers. So ladies and gentlemen, you've learned that the phones of Mr. Demons and Mr. Williams travel in from 3.20 a.m. in 40 minutes all the way out to US 27 in Pembroke Road. And so why is that important? You've learned from watching the videos of the geography how long it takes to get from the studio out to 184th and Miramar Parkway. That's about a couple blocks north of the Sunset Lakes 40th Street entrance. You've learned that. So now you know that in an how long it takes to go all the way up to Pine Boulevard, because as you've learned, Hamburg Road doesn't go through. You have to go all the way to Pines to get across. So then on the other side, you have Mr. Thomas in the great Jeep the deceased in the rear passenger seat, and Mr. Withers, the driver of the red Mitsubishi. And they're both on Sprint. If you recall, Mr. Demons and Mr. Williams, same phones, same phone planes. Mr. Thomas, Mr. Withers, both on Sprint. Because at this point, T-Mobile and Sprint were two different companies. They have since merged. Again, you're showing the same pattern of travel. From the studio, going north <coughs> up to Sunrise, Sunrise down I-95, 595 across to I-75 south to Miramar Parkway. And they are showing consistently traveling together. Then we have Francois, track, his phone. Here's his alibi. He's home. This is the Margate Toscana apartments that you've heard about and learned about. 
He is nowhere near US 27. He's nowhere near the recording studio. He's at his home in Markey, his apartment. Until noon the next day. Then for some reason, at noon, on October 26 of 2018, Jameson Francois' phone is out there in that same US 27 in Pembroke Road location. And so is that in Mr. Demons. Very odd location to go to. Nothing out there except evidence of a murder. <coughs> and ladies and gentlemen, you know the number of shell casings that were found at that scene. And you know that there's at least A through Q fired into the outside of that vehicle. <coughs> Not including the ones inside the vehicle in terms of the number of shots that are fired. But they're going back there. So going back to Mr. Demons' phone at 4.40 a.m., remember the timing advance fans. So at this point, at 4.40 a.m., you also have seen the Memorial Miramar video, where at 4.35, and Memorial Hospital is right here, at 4.35, five minutes earlier, Portland Henry drives the gray jeep into the hospital with the two deceased victims. So you know where Anthony Williams is, you know where Christopher Thomas is, and you know where Portland Henry is because it's on video. So then you have the timing advance band. And again, this goes to where is the phone? Because the phone, it's, you've learned, connects and talks to the tower no matter what. But the phone doesn't make outgoing phone calls on its own. The phone doesn't send text messages on its own. That takes user input. So here's an example of the drop pin at 4.42 a.m. to Frederick Gibbons. This is from Special Agent Collins showing where on this red band the phone would be based on the phone network records. Then we have the phone itself saying where it is. Pretty consistent. So let's talk about whose phone it is. And I know it was a lot of video of pictures to watch. I know that. I'm not going to, we all know that I can count to 500 and stuff. So I want to make sure that everyone understands why it's important as to who the phone shows. <coughs> All of these photos, all of these FaceTimes show the defendant. There's not a single instance that's been put before you in that phone, which is in evidence, it states 64 of the extraction, and then the phone itself as well, that says, hey, this is so-and-so, I'm using Millie's phone. You don't have that because it doesn't exist. Instead, you have this defendant <coughs> using this phone. And he's the only person using this phone. And so ladies and gentlemen, it's important to note that this isn't the polished, perfect shots. These are the outtakes. These are the ones that aren't suitable for public consumption, that aren't put out on Instagram, that aren't put out there to promote an album or anything like that. These are the raw images. That's why it's important to look at those. And ladies and gentlemen, just because there's a photo on this phone of something else, if you take a photo of your dog with your phone, it doesn't mean it's your dog's phone. 
you're taking pictures of what's important to you. I submit to you, you can tell based on these photos and these videos what's important to this defendant. The videos. I'm just going to play one, but this is, like I said, a sample of the 1,000 sun. This one is interesting <coughs> because you see the reflection of the foam in the glasses. The videos also show, if you recall, the video of the Western Union. <coughs> 772-713-9807, October 2nd of 2018. This is the only individual that is using this phone. Talking about the jail call. You heard about six minutes of this call, and of which part there's two minutes where it's silent. What is that? You learn during the course of that call, that the phone, 772-713-9807, didn't have money to pay for the minutes for the jail call. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna remind you what that jail call said. Hello, this is a collect call from Morgan. An inmate at Broward County Main Jail. This call is subject to reporting and monitoring. To continue, press one. To disconnect, press two. Thank you for using security. You may start the conversation now. Hello? There, Mom. Hey, baby. Why don't you just call my phone while I got my credit card? Mm -hmm. uh, you should have called my phone, baby, because I put money on my phone. It's it, it money on my phone. No, you had money instead of this account. I just put my credit card on your phone now. Yeah, over here you could. Oh, yeah, my credit card is equipped. Yeah, I don't know your credit card number because it asked for like your um, expiration date and your zip code. I don't know what your stuff is that went to that card. What are your 7 11? Like 7 11 is your line. What you doing, baby? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm driving around. I'm um, just on um, my credit card. I'm going to keep my credit card number. Your phone because he said I'll be answering the phone when I'm supposed to. <laughs> yeah, oh, he just said he loves you, keep your head up, um, and everything. And then, yeah, easy, easy. Where's been texting your phone? I ain't been reading your stuff, but he, he got like text messages from him. I don't know if you want me to call him or anything on three way or I'm gonna call Justin home. Who is that? Hold on. You got your number? Yes, yes, I'm home. Just don't. Oh, he did, sir. Okay. 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 What's the number? Is there? I need facial recognition. Uh, seven six two five five six. Seven. Oh my God! I'm trying to drive. I'm trying to do this. Hold on. Seven six two five five six. Yeah. Yeah. Right here, real quick. I just like. Hold on. I'm about to have a right here, so I can um do this for you. But I'm trying to do two new things at once. So what did we learn in that phone call? And I fast forwarded through the part where they're putting the credit card phone number in. They use GPS. They find it reliable to find a 7-Eleven. That's the defendant's phone. Why are you using calling my phone? That Mariah is there with Jamie King. That is the phone number that's being called. That's being identified as my phone by the defendant. So 
Let's talk about some of the text messages. And ladies and gentlemen, you will have those to go through and look at them. You'll have the one, and I submit to you that crazy or crazy lady is Jamie King. Go through and read those messages. You can see it's a mother-son relationship. I love you, kid. Son. All of those types of endearments showing you who's using the 98 or 7 phone. We also have with Anthony Williams. He's listed as the contract as twin. Ladies and gentlemen, we've gone over the messages where you can see the animosity, that there is some tension between Mr. Williams and Mr. Demons, where Mr. Williams is making it clear that, and I would fully agree, Mr. Demons was a talented musical artist. Anthony Williams had not had that level of success. <coughs> Christopher Thomas didn't have that level of success. And they don't have that opportunity because the defendant killed them. But the defendant was making money. He was the one that was the revenue source, the meal ticket in that house. Look at the messages. Look at the tone of them. Look who's asking for money. Look at the way they communicate about things for the house, about food. And look at where Anthony Williams is saying, look, I'm the CEO. The others are artists. Anthony is saying, myself, Mr. Demons, Mr. Thomas, we're the CEOs. But at that time, Mr. Demons is the only one who's actually putting in the work who's doing anything, who's making the money, who's recording the songs. You have the chat with Frederick Gibbons. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the one in which the defendant asked to be picked up from the side of Pembroke Road. That's that drop pin that we talked about in relation to the cast records. That phone is being used by the person who committed the murder. And ladies and gentlemen, the only evidence before you, the only evidence is that the only person that used that phone was the defendant, Jamel Dennis. So go through and look at some of the videos. You have the studio video. You have the brief clip of the documentary. Watch what the defendant's doing with his phone during that. Glued to that phone. Glued to it. So let's talk about the activity and the location data. What does this show? We have on October 25th of 2018, 8.14 p.m., a scent of a CF, or a current location, a drop pin. That one is sent to Anthony Williams. We can look at the messages and look at all of this and verify all of these. Then the next one going from the bottom up, we have 4.42.49 a.m. That's the first one on the side of 178, just south of Pembroke Road. Near blocks from the hospital. Then we go to the second one, 4.53.30. You can look and you can see based on the numbers how close those two drop pins are from one another. Negative 80.38, negative 80.38, 25.98, And you can see the time difference between the two of those. And then, this part is key. The next Wi-Fi the defendant connects to is not at his house, not at the YNW Castle, but at Frito Banks. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the defendant committed the murder, dropped off on the side of the road, and then needs to find a way to get home. He can't go home 
because the other people in the run Mitsubishi, they didn't know what happened. And they need time to get their story straight. And police don't know about Frito Bang's involvement. In fact, police don't find out about Frito Bang and the picking up of this until February and March of 2019, after the defendant's in custody. So what we had to look at now, Frito's house, Wi-Fi, 847. And then look, it connects back again automatically at 1227. That further verifies and corroborates the trip back to US 27 and Pembroke Road at noon. That I submit to you was to pick up shell casings. Then we go back and we have the one that we did in open court. The one at 6.41 p.m. That is at that location at the video shoot. 10.27 at 3.02 a.m. That is the next time the defendant returns to that house. The YMW Castle. The 18521 Southwest 44th. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes common sense is not so common. And these details are things that are not being contemplated after the murder. Because if the version that was brought in by Mr. Davis, the defense witness, is to be believed, that phone should have gone to the house. That phone should have connected to the YNW Castle Wi-Fi. Not be sending drop pins all over the county <coughs> and connecting to somebody else's Wi-Fi before finally going back to that house. So remember, that phone showed mobile all the way till 4.03 a.m. That's when it went outdoor stationary. So ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, that's when that drive-by was staged and the victims were killed sometime between the highway at Miramar Parkway and I-75 and getting out to US-27. Because you learned they were dead for some time. And look, there's no way to put an exact amount on there, but they were, hearts were not beating when that drive-by was staged. So then if we go into the steps, if you recall, the drop pins, 442, 1,397 steps, 945 meters. And ladies and gentlemen, you can go back, and this is in evidence, you can look through and see when the defendant's at the studio, in the recording studio, you don't see this type of movement. If the defendant was home in bed, <coughs> you wouldn't have any activity. As to if it's 70 steps, 80 steps, 50 steps, you would have zero if the defendant was home in bed with his phone. As you recall, 4.03 a.m. is when the phone is saying outdoor stationary inside of Pembroke Road 27. So let's go to Felicia Holmes. Felicia Holmes, I think it is safe to say, <coughs> hates me. And I'm okay with that. Because my job is to prosecute a crime and prove that it happened. Ms. Holmes didn't show up for a summons. There are consequences if you do not comply with court orders. You were served a jury summons to show up, just as she was served a subpoena to show up. I'm not going to apologize for doing my job. But what I am going to say is remember her testimony. And I have to say the photos are courtesy of law and crime, so I appreciate their allowing me to use those. Ms. Holmes did everything she could, everything
everything she could to not perjure herself because she didn't want to say she lied to law enforcement. Is that what you learned from? So she was this whole, I don't remember, I don't remember. But even with all of that, she did remember one very important detail. Mr. Dennis on a FaceTime call with her daughter. So you know at that point, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Demons... Objection. There's no such testimony. I object to that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you are to rely on your own recollection of the evidence. This is counsel's uh, <coughs> summation of what she believes is the evidence. Proceed, counsel. You heard from her mouth that she heard her daughter scream and that then she spoke with the defendant on FaceTime. Objection. Thank you. Same, same ruling, ladies and gentlemen. You are to rely on your own recollection of the evidence. Proceed. She was asked if it was knew about a drive-by shooting because the cover-up has already started. And remember, Cortland Henry is at the hospital. 435. Mr. Demons is not. But they've already worked out this story to try and get away with murder. Whatever was said on that phone call was so troubling and so disturbing to Ms. Holmes that she and her daughter then drove immediately to Broward County. She remembers Frito Bang's house. She remembers lunch. But doesn't remember the contents of the call, doesn't now remember the phone number that was used or anything like that doesn't know her 17-year-old daughter's phone number at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, common sense. A mother is going to know her child's phone number. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that little detail about the $5,000 that she got, that wasn't from the state. She says, oh no, that was, that was for a vacation. That was hush money. That's what that $5,000 was. Objection. There's no evidence for that. Ladies and gentlemen, you are to rely on your own recollection of the evidence. This is argument. Proceed. So if you recall, Ms. Holmes identified that driver's license in the Snapchat video. That's her daughter, Mariah Hamilton. You can see Again, one of the photos that was previously shown, Ms. Hamilton and Mr. Dennett spoke on FaceTime all the time. And Mr. Demons took screenshots all the time. Always making content, whether on purpose or not. Every single time that you can see this is an example of showing this was his pattern. And ladies and gentlemen, remember Ms. Johnson from T-Mobile. The call detail records are just that, calls, not data. A FaceTime, a video communication is a data usage on a phone, not a cellular telephone call. So you're not going to see a cellular telephone call on the CDR showing Ms. Holmes and Ms. Hamilton's phone call from the side of the road. Javion Glass, the red Mitsubishi. What did we learn from Mr. Glass? We learned that the red Mitsubishi did not stop at the gate. And ladies and gentlemen, that's consistent with the physical evidence, with all of the cell phones, with everything else that cannot be changed by a person's failure to recall, that is in the records, that is on video. That's what you can show to corroborate, to show that he is being honest. Mr. Glass said, Mr. Demons was not in the car, that red Mitsubishi, at any point on October 26 of 2018. Same four people got in, same four people got out. He recalled the different clothing 
The defendant was wearing it at Frito Bang's house. And he authenticated those photos that Danny Polo first introduced, that those were from that evening, where you see Anthony Williams sitting on a couch smiling, where you see Christopher Thomas animated standing up, where you see Jim Al Demons doing a handshake with the engineer. And look at those photos, ladies and gentlemen. Because if you zoom in and you look up at the top of the one photo where the engineer is sitting down at the computer, and Mr. Demons is standing up, you can see the exact same screen grabs of the studio surveillance footage that you watch. You can see the red Mitsubishi and the gray Jeep parked just as they were. So Mr. Glass said that the red Mitsubishi did not stop. Just because you're in a courtroom doesn't mean common sense doesn't apply. If you fall asleep in a car and the lulling motion of the car driving puts you to sleep. That first red light, when you get off the other interstate, wakes you up. These are things that you can rely on in your own personal experience to say, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. That the Red Mitsubishi didn't stop. That the 30 minutes and 30 miles are consistent with one another. That there was no stopping on the side of the road. And also, there's no reason. There is no reason that's put, put before this jury whatsoever. Not in the phone records, not in the Snapchat, nothing that explains why eight people that are going to the exact same location would stop on the side of the road, one person would switch a car. No reason whatsoever. And ladies and gentlemen, you can look at those videos and see the cars are tracking together, the phones are tracking together. <coughs> all the way through until they get to 184. So we have the memorial mirror mark that gives us that time stamp on Mr. Henry. And we also know that here Mr. Henry changed clothes. So we have in short sleeves at the studio, and now wearing long sleeves as he runs in to talk to Officer Amagor, who was the detail officer working at the hospital. So what you have learned from this, and you can watch it again, they first bring in the body of Anthony Williams, who's that front seat passenger. Then they, in the pictures that you can see from the Jeep at the hospital, they then recline that seat all the way forward to take out Mr. Thomas, and they bring Mr. Thomas into the hospital. I'm not gonna play the video now, but so you know at this point that Cortland Henry has changed clothes. And that'll become important again in a moment. So George Bello, I don't think he has uh, dropped off your certificates and firearms, but I am assured they are coming. You learned that he is part of the Broward Sheriff's Office Crime Lab Firearms and Tool Marks Unit, that he is the manager of that unit, that he has worked in that particular area for a number of years, both here and in Dade County. And you learned more about firearms and how a casing is marked by a firearm, how a projectile is marked. And this is just some of the things that you've learned. Shapes of firing pins, breech face marks, Extractor marks, ejector marks, lands and grooves, rifling, the class characteristics, which means every specific Glock 19 has these same class characteristics. The rifling, the lands and grooves, right? Those are going to be the same for each Glock 19. But then you learn the individual characteristics are the things that make each firearm unique. 
So what code did you learn specifically on this casings and projectiles? So starting with the projectile, this was recovered from Anthony Williams. This was from his shoulder. We have the ones from Christopher Thomas, and this is just a sample of the seven that were recovered. So what do you learn about all of these projectiles? You learn about the projectiles from the Jeep. And again, this is just a sample, not all of them. So you learn that numbers 13, 14, and 15, right? So those are going to be the ones from the Jeep. And if you, the easiest way to reference all of these, ladies and gentlemen, is the G number. The group number, which is the one that's assigned by Miramar, and that's on the packaging for each of those particular items of evidence. So you learn that 13, 14, and 15, which came out of that Jeep, were all fired. 13 and 15 are definitely the same weapon. And 14 is very likely to be the same, but it has too much damage to make a full conclusion on that. So then on the ones from Mr. Thomas and Mr. Williams. That's the G44, 57 through 63. Again, they, some of them have both class and individual characteristics, which they could have been fired from the same weapon. And the rest have just class characteristics. And so then we have the cartridge casing. So this casing, is at the passenger, rear, driver's side, floorboard. The exact seat Mr. Demons was sitting in, in a plastic bag. This cartridge casing is found October 26 of 2018. Then we go to November 21st of 2018 where you heard about the testimony they had to use the canine to find these particular artifacts. All these eight casings are consistent and fired from the same weapon as the one inside the car. From this, ladies and gentlemen, and we went through the cantilers, the lands, the grooves, the rifling on all of those. So we go through every single one, and that's G196 through 203, right? They all match. And so you learn from George Bellow that he doesn't have a weapon for comparison. And he gives a list, 30 or so weapons, that could have caused this particular casing and projectile. Right? So you learn that without the actual firearm and the exact same ammunition, you can't do a range of fire or distance determination because there are things in each fire that would affect that. You want to, in any scientific experiment, make as few variables as possible. If you don't have the gun, you can't do it. So then you also learn that if you don't have the gun, you cannot match the casings to the projectiles. You can match projectile to projectile and casing to casing, but you can't match one to the other because there's different marks from different parts of the gun. Other important thing, George Bello specifically excluded Glock firearms because they have a different, very distinct type of rifle. So all those Glock related firearm things to Jameson Francois, no relation whatsoever to this case. I can tell you that was not the murder weapon. I can't tell you that what specific gun was the murder weapon. Because it's never been found, there's never been another match to that to this day. So let's go to GSR. Tara Helsell came in and testified from RJ Lee. You learned GSR. Primer, that's what she's testing for and looking at under the scanning electron microscope. Antimony, barium, and lead. That those three, when all three are together, are considered GSR. That is a 
gunshot residue particle, all three of them. You learned that Mr. Henry has one. One three component GSR particle on his left hand. And then there are two component particles, so either lead and antimony, lead and barium, or barium and antimony, right? One on his left hand, and one on his right hand. So you've learned that some of those maybe show up, the two component particles, in other circumstances. But generally you see a third element. I believe she referenced brake pads, and you could also see steel. You don't have that here, right? So you have a three component GSR and a two component GSR, two of those. So the G in 2023, you then have more than nine two component GSR particles found five years later. They're still there. And that you heard from Chris Williams, who obtained those during his shooting reconstruction and sent them in for testing. So what does that tell you about Portland Henry? I mean, Ms. Kelsa was very clear. She goes, I cannot say that GSR being there or GSR not being there means that someone fired a gun. She goes, there's three options. One, they fired a gun. Two, they were in close proximity to someone that fired a gun. Or three, they touched a surface upon which GSR was and it transferred to their skin. So ladies and gentlemen, with regards to the GSR, you also learned that it falls off very quickly. So you have a Jeep covered in two component particles, and you have Mr. Henry having one after changing clothes. What you don't have is an answer as to Mr. Dennis, because he was never tested. Because he didn't speak to law enforcement that day, he didn't go to the hospital, he was never tested for GSR. <clears throat> Nothing on that. So you can't draw a conclusion one way or the other as to GSR because there is no answer to that. <clears throat> so again, George Bello says all eight casings are all from the same firearm. You can't have a drive-by and have a casing right up inside the car. doesn't work that way. So then we get to Mr. Henry's statement, part of the cover up. So you hear I was getting sleepy, I was almost home. Out of nowhere I heard gunshots. I ducked down, you know, almost crashed the car. And these are from that sheet that you had. And if you want to listen to that statement again, those will be made available to you as well as the disc, and you, but you would have to come out into the courtroom to look at those. So he's talking about ducking, hitting the median. He's embellishing, trying to sell this story. Because there's no evidence that shows any sort of tire damage, any sort of rim damage whatsoever. But in the, no description, no idea what type of car, nothing on that. Because there wasn't one. But he is trying to build a cover story to take this defendant and separate him from the shooting. So as you learned, how Miramar Parkway <coughs> is laid out. And you learned that the Miramar Police Department shut down Miramar Parkway and walked more than two miles. They walked from I-75 all the way to 184. <coughs> And so when you look at Miramar Parkway and the geography of it compared to Mr. Henry's statement, it's interesting to note that the hospital is right there. If it had happened as he stated, we wouldn't have differing time frames on the post-mortem wounds and the fatal wounds. That's a mile. From I-75 to 172nd, one mile. From 172nd to Pembroke Road, one mile. If that's where this happened, 
you would have evidence of it. And there is none. There's no casings, there's no glass, there's no projectiles. So from this, and you, the, all the cell phone records show consistent path of travel all the way across Miramar Parkway to 184. That is when everything splits. And if you recall, Detective Hector Bertrand testified when these maps were placed into evidence. So let's go to the DNA. On October 26th of 2018, Chris Carter swabbed the rear driver's side door handle interior. It wasn't tested until later because, ladies and gentlemen, as you can tell, investigations are fluid. They evolve. Let's not also forget, we had 15 months of a global pandemic where nobody came into this building. So this isn't tested <coughs> until later on. Doesn't change what's on the swap. As you've learned and from both Kurt Rhodes, the DNA expert, if you have DNA on there and it's in an optimal environment, like a cotton swab, it's gonna be there pretty much indefinitely. On this swab, when it is tested, from this door handle with the blood on it. Here's what you have. Very strong support for Christopher Thomas. Limited support that Anthony Williams is also included. And very strong support that Jamal Demons' DNA is on that door. So ladies and gentlemen, when an item is tested, it doesn't change the results. There are many factors that go into when an item is tested. <clears throat> Witnesses aren't being cooperative. You have to come up with a different way to prove it. This is the other way to prove it, ladies and gentlemen. That his DNA was on that door. <clears throat> Let's go to the trace evidence. This is a very unique <coughs> of evidence that you don't see very often in any case. And what does the glass on US 27 in Pembroke Road tell us? Let's think about this. The glass is on the north side of the road. Why is that important? So if you have Ellie's murder mobile on the south side of the road, stage the drive-by, you now have a ton of shattered glass. Some in the vehicle, some hanging on. You have to leave that area. How do you go from facing eastbound on the south part of the road to going back to US 27, because that's the only way out, as you've learned, pop a U-E. What happens when you pop a U-turn? All the glass that was in that vehicle is then thrown out to the north side of the road as they make that U-turn. So ladies and gentlemen, that's why this glass was collected and that's what it shows. It shows the pattern of travel and the fact that this did happen in Miramar on the south side of Pembroke Road. So you have the different populations of glass and you heard from James Morano that the two different types that he went through and he compared them and that they are consistent, both the standards as well as the ones on the side of the road. It's another thing and another level of showing you that this Jeep was out there. That this was a cover-up. That this was not a drive-by. So let's go to the games. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm limited on time in terms of what I can talk about. So in some areas I'm going to be brief. This is one of those. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence clearly shows the defendant is a G-Shine blood gang member. And so for the purposes of the jury instructions that His Honor just read to you, you have to determine if at the time of this offense, if the murder of his two friends benefited the defendant. And in benefiting the defendant and promoting or benefiting his position in the gang, 
it then helped the gang itself. You learned many, many things about G Shine, the organization. And I think the most important thing to look at is to compare and contrast the public facing, the YouTube videos, the gang signs, the music videos, the motto for the album, right? Those could be an actor. <coughs> that could be a show put on for the public. But look at the private side, the not for public consumption. Look at those messages. And look at that, there is a benefit to both sides. The gang gets notoriety, gets money. The defendant, he gets access to different venues. As well. He gets protection. He gets a sense of whatever you want to call comes along with being a gang member. And so ladies and gentlemen, you heard lots of testimony from Detective Danny Polo as to what the primary activities of G-Shine, of GKB, Gangster Killer Bullets are. You learned that they're the enforcers. You learned that they are violent. You have that information before you in those text messages. The nighttime drive. This shows the conditions under which this murder took place. This is not an area you find by accident or misfortune. This is a planned drive out to the edge of the Everglades where there's not going to be any witnesses. This shows pre-planning and premeditation. This is a consistent, quick, no stops, no detours ride out here. And so some of the things that you can look for for premeditation, the nature of the weapon used. So having the firearm already. And ladies and gentlemen, how do you know that they have the firearm already and the defendant had the firearm already? Because he asked for it the day before. Remember, on October 25th, Jamel Demons, 9807, sent a text message to Anthony Williams <coughs> asking, where's the fire at? FYE. And Mr. Williams says, it's in here with us. And if you look at the context of the conversations, that shows they were driving down from a location in Stewart, and they were driving to pick the defendant up at the airport. Mr. Williams brought his own murder weapon to the defendant. Look at the rest of the conversations. There's multiple discussions about this firearm. Where's the firearm? From Mr. Williams to Mr. Demons earlier on. It's in my closet, closet, third shoebox. This is discussed. That is not a lighter. That is not a really great song. That's a firearm, ladies and gentlemen. There is discussion about firearms. The presence or absence of adequate provocation. When you look at that and you're looking at this case, they were, they were friends, right? They were buddies since they grew up. But look at the stress being placed on this defendant as the only one bringing the money in, as the only person who is paying the bills. Look at the tension on there, right? Look at the issues and concerns with Mr. Williams, Anthony Williams, and the defendant's mother, that they're fighting an argument. The message is on there to that effect. So look at, for premeditation, you can also look at the manner in which the homicide was committed. <laughs> Anthony Williams was shot in the back of the head. 
That was planned for when he was sleeping so that he could not fight back. That was a premeditated, planned killing of Anthony Williams, where there would be an alibi already discussed. So then, Christopher Thomas. Premeditation, as the judge instructed you, does not require days, weeks, months of planning. Premeditation can be formed quickly. Example we use in jury selection. Go into your mom's house on Mother's Day. You forget to bring flowers. You reach down, pull some flowers out of her yard, and give her to those. That is premeditation. That is thinking about something, then doing it. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you the murder of Christopher Thomas was premeditated in that as well. Chris Thomas, as you saw with Sergeant Williams and Mr. Howard demonstrating, oh my goodness, what's going on? Mr. Demons then made the decision at that point he couldn't have a witness. So look at that. Those are all things in which you can get premeditation, how it was committed, the wounds that were inflicted, the back of the head. <clears throat> Going to Facebook. Showing again that the different information that you have before you belongs to this defendant. 772-713-9807. Melly Montana at iCloud.com is the email. Remember the Snapchat? Melly.Montana. These are names that the defendant uses over and over again to talk about and communicate and identify himself. And look, that phone says verified as belonging to Jamal Demons. Also remember Facebook. We have October 26th of 2018. Sun's going down. And the defendant's phone also shows him at this location in Coco. And he is dancing and singing and performing, wearing the same jacket, an identical jacket to what Chris Thomas was wearing the night before, and showing Mr. Henry wearing the denim jacket, like Mr. Williams was wearing the night before. And so the question was posed about a contractual agreement and losing money to be there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, look at the text messages between Mr. Demons and his mother. Because he didn't, wasn't worried a couple of months before about missing a show because he was getting his hair braided and losing $1,000. But then this night, when his friends were killed, He's dancing and partying around and is worried about a contractual agreement. Just look at those types of information and those types of behavior and how someone is acting. Snapchat. If you recall, this is the argument between Mariah Hamilton and Jamel Demons, Nellie Montana. Bort, coming everywhere with me, because if them crackers come grab him, it's my fault, you forgot. <coughs> I keep Portland with, because at the end of the day, he did one of the realest shit in my life. Yeah, he covered up a murder. Did a very terrible job of it, but that's what he did. That's what this is referring to. This is less than two weeks after this homicide occurs, and that's what they're talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a confession in this case. The defendant, and now look at the time. Remember we talked about the UTC? So subtract four. So UTC, 20 hundred hours. You subtract four, 16 hundred hours. You do the conversion, so 4 p.m. 4 p.m., I did that with the smiley face. And that's what I said in opening. Context is key. The whole floor is coding. 
awesome if you work at Google. Terrible at Broward General Hospital. Context is key. So you've learned PZ Gambino. As you heard from Detective Moretti, he's potentially facing federal firearms charges, the gun dealer. It's told by the defendant, I did that. Shh. And look at the messages between Mr. Demons and Mr. Gambino. PZ Gambino is a blood gang member. He uses all those same information, slang words, changing of the letters that you learned about from Detective Polo. October 26th, he asks to reach out to see how the defendant's doing. And the defendant says, I did that. <laughs> and to make a spelling that, oh, other times he uses D-A-T. And gentlemen, you saw the song where he has a song that he's released called T-H-A-T in his phone. So again, Instagram and how these all fit together. 6.58 a.m., Jamie King, RN, the defendant's mother, are you here? I'm in Miami. I'm by the stadium. I'm a mess. I'm so worried. I'm here. Remember those CDRs where you have sending her to voicemail? Ladies and gentlemen, this shows that she's trying to contact her son. He is ignoring her, and so she's reaching out to her son, who responds back with, I love you, Mom. I'm good, Mom. Because he had the phone at that point. So the judge read you the law. Anthony Williams is dead, and it was premeditated. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you the evidence very clearly shows the defendant was caused by Jamel Demings. Same as to Christopher Thomas. Talks about premeditation. Principles. So if, ladies and gentlemen, if you believe that Cortland Henry, and Cortland Henry is charged, but that is for another jury on another day, if Cortland Henry assisted and helped and shot these two individuals to help out Mr. Demons, Mr. Demons is just as guilty. Because a principal is someone who decides to help before the murder is completed. And you have that with Mr. Henry and making that drive and going out to the edge of the Everglades. You have that. He is a principal to first degree murder. Mr. Dennis is just as guilty and so is Mr. Henry. So in my few remaining moments, I want to briefly touch on the uh, unlucky 13, because I'll give Mr. Edelstein, Mr. Henry, he's charged, right? So from all those unlucky 13 people that are listed as suspects, they have one thing in common, and only one thing in common. They made a single online threat. In poor taste, yes. Any other evidence that ties them to this case? None. No location data. No communication from anyone in that Jeep to say where they were. No DNA of any of those people on that Jeep. No ballistics evidence at their feet where they were sitting in that Jeep. No private confession. Because remember, all of these online threats, they're out there for the public because they're trying to get attention and trying to get some sort of benefit for that for themselves. Distasteful? Yes. A crime? No. There's no drop pins for an emergency pickup from any of those individuals. There's no phone for any of them at any of the scenes in this case. So, motive. We talked long and hard, but we don't have to prove motive. Motive? intent. Intent is an action of the mind. So I'll give you motives. Anger. Greed. Resentment. Advancement in the gang. You 
heard $16 million was coming into Jameson Francois, and that you saw $15,000, $10,000 payments going to Mr. Demons. Simple math. Splitting something four ways or two ways with Mr. Henry, who wasn't smart enough to even properly give a statement to keep Mr. Demons away from the car. So we have all these pieces of the puzzle that we have just talked about. And each and every one shows how this case has been brought together. Shows the physical evidence. And so ladies and gentlemen, there's no murder weapon, right? The question that you have to answer, and that you can now answer based on all of this evidence, is that Jamel Demons was sitting in the back seat of that Jeep. And he was the one that fired the fatal shots that killed Christopher Thomas and Anthony Williams. And you know that because even if you choose to disbelieve one part of the evidence, two parts of the evidence, you can see what the overall picture is. The overall picture puts Mr. Demons in the back seat of that Jeep. It puts him holding a gun. You don't need a murder weapon to know that he committed these two crimes. Ladies and gentlemen, I would ask that you serve justice, that you deliberate, and that you return a verdict of guilty as charged as to murder in the first degree. Thank you. Can I see Pastor Sorry, Thank you.